Hey everybody, in today's video, we are gonna be making one of these pry bars out of stainless steel. I originally did a prototype batch out of brass and it went super well. They were easy to make, they were very fast, but brass does not make a very good pry bar. So that's why we're going to stainless for the production pry bars. This ugh, is about $350 worth of 17.4 stainless steel and it's the stock we'll be using for our pry bars. And we're gonna be making these with a method that I call the salami slice method which basically means that the pry bars are gonna be oriented like that in the part. And I'll machine them from the top and then come back and part them off and finish the bottom with a slitting saw, thus removing it from the top of the stock, which then allows me to go ahead and make the next pry bar down. This is about three inches of stock and I should be able to get about 10 pry bars out of here. So this is what my setup looks like. I've got a piece of stock sticking straight up out of the vise. And then if you were wondering, I put a second vise here because when I do production, I wanna have two stations going at the same time just to optimize for work holding density. This is my cam setup. We have the part centered at the top, Z axis facing up, X axis facing right, Y axis facing backwards with the work coordinate system being dead in the center. Then we use an adaptive tool path to rough out the material parallel to finish the face, 2D contour to finish the walls, and then come in with a slitting saw to part it off. Once we go into production, this will be patterned down about 10 times to get our 10 different pry bars. I have very little experience cutting stainless, so I have no idea how this was gonna go. The one time I tried it before now, uh, it went very poorly. So hopefully, hopefully this will be better. Unfortunately, I need to run these with flood coolant, which means it's gonna be really hard to film, so I'm just gonna time lapse it. All right, that went pretty well, though maybe not quite perfectly. Yeah, we did get a good part though. The finishes on the top here are actually pretty good. The only thing that I think didn't go perfectly was the saw just sounded terrible. And I played with feeds and speed some and I got it a little bit better, but it still worries me. And I'm afraid that I'm gonna kill the, the life of that very expensive saw blade. Um, and or ruin my holder if it if it shatters. So I'm gonna try to find a better recipe. On this one, I went kind of slow. On the next one, I'm gonna take shallower passes, but with a more aggressive feed and maybe that'll do it. But looking at it, the finish on the top of this bar here is actually really good. So I don't know, maybe saws just sound like that. I suppose good finishes with a bad sound could mean that it's burnishing the material, i.e. I'm cutting too slowly and it's um, rubbing the material until it shines which is a good way to get good finishes, but bad for tool life. And I wanna make this $100 saw last as long as I can. The part itself looks great. I'm gonna put these through probably a three-stage tumbling process and get them, I, I mean, not mere polish, but get them a nice, pretty polish. And this is a good starting point. The finishes on there are basically as good as they're gonna get off of my machine. The only exception is inside the jimping here on the side, there's a little bit of chatter. I'm not sure if that's gonna come out of the tumbling because it's kind of protected by the rest of the, the pry bar, but we'll see. So I was afraid this saw had a little bit of a wobble when it was cutting. So I've taken it all apart here. I'm gonna take some isopropyl alcohol, get everything cleaned down really well and get it reassembled just to make sure that there's, you know, there wasn't a chip or something that was making it wonky. So we have a problem. I started doing a second test and this time I was going to do two pry bars in a row. Problem is I did not check the correct checkbox in how it did the pattern. And so it was doing all of its tool paths in order instead of doing them one at a time. This resulted in bad things happening. I heard some terrible noises and I went and I stopped the machine and this is, this is where it is now. Looking at it, I don't know what the bad noises were but it's probably a broken tool. We'll, we'll see. All right, can I just retract? Oh, I gotta power everything up first. I can just bring Z up. Upon further examination, the tool is definitely busted. It broke off all the, the corners. I may have rubbed the collet just a little bit, but it doesn't look that bad. Nothing that's not still usable. It's just some cosmetic damage. 
Uh, so I should be able to throw a new tool in there and keep going, I guess. All right, new tool is in there. And I haven't ruined anything beyond the top surface. So I think if I just offset my Z axis down a bit, I can just keep going and not lose any parts. All right, we're back at it. Do you remember when I cleaned that saw blade? Do you wanna guess what I did? Okay, this saw definitely does have some run out to it. What I've done here is I've jogged it up really close to this wall and then I'm just manually turning it by hand, basically just eyeballing the run out. And I mean, it gets stuck there and there, well, there, um, which implies to me the saw is not round or it's a little bit off center, which is interesting because this should be a nice quality saw and it's a nice quality holder. And I haven't done anything violent to them. I don't know if this is normal. I don't know if it's the saw, if it's the tool holder, or if it's something I'm doing or have done. That's interesting though. That might be part of my problem. My new feeds and speeds sound a lot better. Something's still off. This, is, this isn't how it should sound, but it's cutting. Okay, this is an interesting first for me. My uh, salami slice did not fully remove itself, which is not something I have seen before. I assume it's because the stainless is just a little bit more resilient than brass. That is not a good thing for product reliability, or excuse me, process reliability. I'm gonna have to come in deeper with that saw to make sure that doesn't happen again. All right, I have three pry bars done. It took a little bit of finagling on the last two, but I think we have our flaws worked out. So I'm gonna go ahead and try out two more just off the top here, and hopefully that'll you know sort out our automation issues. And if that works, then we can do the rest of them as one chunk. Okay, I just finished up a program where I made two pry bars in a row. The first pry bar is right here. Interestingly, this one is still attached and I don't know why. This should have released. It's using the exact same code that the one on top used, just patterned down. So it's not like that's any different. But this one, I mean, the tab in there is pretty, pretty good. Maybe my saw's wearing out or something, but that seems rather rapid. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's still wiggling. I'll wiggle it off eventually. There we go. So I guess it needs even more overlap, but something's going on here. And then also I didn't quite get all of the, the roughing marks out of the inside of this one, which is also kind of strange. So I need to give it more of a, um, a stock to leave on my roughing passes and clean it up with the finishing pass. And this is why we do tests before moving to production. I've lost count of how many we've done at this point, but the next revision is starting now. You probably couldn't see what happened there, but in the last code revision, I tried increasing this depth of cut and earlier I reduced the RPM on this tool quite a bit. Basically, I've gone so far down the RPM scale on this that I'm really starting to lose the torque on the machine. So it stalled out when it was doing this cut. So I'll have to go back to my old feeds and speeds. They worked better anyway. All right, we're back to something. It's kind of three quarters of the way back to the old speeds and feeds. Just slightly more aggressive and it sounds much better and it'll cut just a little bit faster. It's a couple days later and I've been slowly experimenting on this in the background. I've whittled away all of my stock and this is what is left of the original bar. As expected, I got 10 different pry bars out of it. Uh, due to my experimentation, five are bad, five are good. I just put the green zip ties on the good ones so after they're done tumbling, I know which are which. We're all set up for the first production run. I just have one piece of material in here because I'm not sure how tool life is gonna to hold out throughout this whole process. I do have the automated tool checking turned on. So it'll you know do a tool breakage detection after each time it uses the tool. So that'll give me a little bit more safety. But I'm gonna hit go and hopefully we end up with 20 pry bars in four hours.
Here's the aftermath from that first production run. It went off without any problems. The only thing is I thought I patterned it down 10 times in cam, but I only did nine times. And there's actually enough material here to get two more pry bars. So I'll quickly run those before uh, going on to the next batch. But yeah, I'm really happy with how this worked out. At this point, I only need 40 pry bars plus some inventory for my Etsy page. So I'm gonna run this, I don't know, basically for the rest of the day, which I'll do off camera, because at this point I think I've gotten the point across. I really love this salami slice method. It's such a great way to get a lot of parts without a lot of human interaction. In the future, I'm going to do my best to design my products to be able to use this method just because it's so efficient. If you wanna buy something we make, you can find it at designtheeverything.com. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.